Hey everybody and welcome to Linear Algebra. I want to talk today just about proofs kind of in general and what we're trying to do with proofs. Um, this is something that I always really like talking about because I was a pure math person and this is basically what I spent so much of my adult life basically doing. Um, it's a lot of geometry review, honestly. Like if you, I've taught geometry before and if your geometry teacher spent time to really go into proofs, like a lot of what we'll do today is kind of just blasting through that. I kind of am doing this as a way almost to review like the whole proof unit from geometry, but there might be some stuff in here that you kind of haven't heard before. Um, so yeah, let's just get into it. So, um, what we're really going to be doing a lot in linear algebra is really breaking down these statements um, and trying to figure out if they're true or not. And that's all we really, in a sense, are doing in, in a math class, and usually, is um, you know, these statements that we're given. Um, I wouldn't call them like theorems yet, because once it's a theorem, we know it's true. Um, but basically, a math person tries to spend time figuring out if something is definitely true or definitely false. Um, and the way we do this is that we have studied logic, um, and a lot of today will actually be the like symbolic logic, like truth tables and things like that. Um, but those are actually really, really important. Um, and through that, you'll be able to uh, apply what you know about logic to f statements and hopefully figure out whether they're true or not. Um, this kind of cracked me up. I saw this on the internet and. Not that I'm going to probably do this to you because it's a bit much at this point, but a lot of your math professors, if you keep taking math classes, especially the pure ones, you can do things like totally correct and then just with a very happy face, um, they will basically just take off points for like things like wrong logic flow and things like that. Um, it gets to be much more an art like to do a proof correct is almost more of an art skill rather than like a uh, calculus like how good are you at doing integral skill or something like that and so your um your professors may end up like saying like yeah you did that correct but um you could have done it in three less lines or you could have done it with half the words you've used or whatever um so it becomes something that you get better and better at as you practice it, um, just like everything. But um, this one in particular, I think, can be really like nuanced and weird when you first learn it. So this is just kind of how my brain sees math, I guess. Like right now, all of you are kind of spent your time over here. Everything you do so far in calculus and everything, it's all like solving equations, you're getting data, um, that is a part of math, definitely. It's like the tools for science part. Um, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Like, if you think about it, it's kind of weird that math is the only thing where sometimes we have to add this word pure to it. Like, you never see someone say, like, oh, this is pure English, or this is pure social studies, or this is pure physics, even. Um, this is a very specific thing to math, and it kind of frustrates me because really this bubble that you've lived in, I would argue, is not math. This is science. Science, people think that like math is needed to do science, but people really should change their way of thinking there and realize that science just uses those skills. Like vector calculus and everything in Calc 3, that's just part of physics and part of chemistry and all that stuff. Um, to call that math seems kind of weird. Like that does imply that like there's this other branch and then like this branch is pure math. Um, but in my mind, this is just math. This is what you do in math. You try to prove truths about the world. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen See, can I click this thing here? Let me make this bigger. Um, this is just a funny uh, XKCD comic, but um, basically the idea being that, like, um, you know, you've got all these different fields, and all of these are kind of just like more general versions of the previous one. You know, like physicists are just like um, more general chemists and 
chemists are just more general biologists and blah, blah, blah. But then you've got this math person out here who's like, oh, I didn't see all you guys. Um, but this is really like how I see it. Like the nice part about math is that when you study real math, math like the stuff in this bubble over here, um, this becomes like where we can answer huge questions about the universe. And we don't need to get like kind of stuck in some of the annoying rules that end up in, you know, fields like chemistry and physics and biology. Like we can really just work on big picture ideas, uh, which can make it feel harder, but also I think kind of more fun sometimes. So um, this is just kind of the general, like two ways of thought that go into writing proofs in like a class like linear algebra. Um, there's basically deductive reasoning and then there's inductive reasoning and deductive <clears throat> you start with a general thing and you um, deduce something specific from it whereas inductive you start with a bunch of specific cases and you you get to something some general result from that um, typically math is the first one uh, we will do something called induction this year where that's definitely the second one um, a lot of science, though, is this. It's basically inductive reasoning is like your data-driven stuff where you're just, you know, running a computer model or something and you're getting, you know, another piece of data, another piece of data, another piece of data. And then you can be like, oh, it looks like this general thing is happening. Um, these are just, if you ever take like a philosophy class, you study all this stuff too. And um, these are both like super famous um, statements from like a, a philosophy kind of 101 class or something. Um, but this statement, right, just like Socrates is a mortal man, Aristotle is a mortal man, I think Pyro is how you say it, is a mortal man, Carnetides is a mortal man, therefore all men are mortal. Um, that would definitely be inductive, right? You're going from a bunch of specific things to a general statement like that. Um, a lot of what you're going to see um, is this kind of thing. that are like, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Um, so Socrates is mortal. That's a, you know, this part right here is the conclusion that is very specific. So that's like a deductive way of thinking about things. Um, the one thing that I will kind of just put over here... Um, we will do this proof technique called induction, uh, which is definitely specific to general. Um, and we're not even going to talk about that for a little while still, but um, most of the time in math, we are doing this kind of thing. We start with a general statement and we prove something, um, kind of, we rise to something specific from it. So um, this might seem kind of, silly and basic and um but it is good actually to know some of this symbolic logic stuff and this is the part that like typically you would learn about in geometry but i realize maybe not all of you learned this stuff in geometry but it's really not too bad um and it honestly is very helpful there's like a lot of times when i'm thinking about like if i think back to my hard like graduate school classes and stuff i would take the statement i was trying to prove and like break it into symbolic form and then use the like symbolic logic I know to help me figure out how to prove the thing I want to show. Um, but really what we do is we take, and philosophy does this stuff too. So if any of you are thinking about taking like philosophy classes, like you'll do a bunch of this, but um, basically we put symbolic structure to like words, like these statements down here. Um, they do have to be statements. So they have to have like, a period basically at the end um, to be something that we can do this with. But um, you could have like, it is Wednesday is a statement. And we could just define that as like P. You could say gummy bears are the best food, which I would argue is true. And that would be Q. Uh, you could have an equilateral triangle has two congruent sides, R. Um, these don't have to be true. They're just statements. Remember, these are just things that, statements are just things that we are trying to figure out if they're true or not, right? Um, so like you could say it's Wednesday on Friday and that's fine. Um, it would be false, but you could still assign that a variable and determine its truth basically. Um, 
And once you like have this symbolic form, that's when we get into doing like this kind of stuff. So, you know, the most simple one is definitely like a negation, like it is Monday, then these are the three different ways. Oh, let me show that better. Um, these are the three different ways that we do a negation. Um, the book that we're going to be kind of using uses that one the most, which I, I like. Um, but all of these you might see. I feel like this is the one in CS. A lot of times you see that one for whatever reason. But, um, but all of these, right, these would just read, it is not a Monday. And, you know, if we think about a picture, if this in here is the it is Monday stuff, right? The picture is just showing you, you know, you would be out here. Like any of these things are then the stuff outside that set that apply to it is not Monday. Um, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, the other two that maybe are not so straightforward are these things called conjunctions and disjunctions. So both of these symbols uh, create compound sentences. And the conjunction is the one that's read and, uh, and <laughs> we use this like kind of caret symbol. Um, I actually don't like the way it's written here in retrospect. The caret symbol should really go down further. It like goes to the bottom. It's not the true like caret symbol. Um, basically the way that one is where it's the same height, it should be like that over there. Um, but if you think about like a picture, um, it is just, you know, the stuff in the overlap. It's like your compound inequalities or something. It's just the and part. Like you have to be in this set right here and in this set. And the only way to do that is if you're in between right there. Um, the other one uh, is the disjunction and that's red or, and we do use that like V symbol. And that one is right here. Right, and you get everything in one set, all of that stuff, and, well not, and, or you're in the other set over here. And so you get the and part, that's what I was trying to say, uh, but you also get this other stuff out here. So it gives you more things. When you do a conjunction, you like kind of naturally are being more restrictive and losing some info where the disjunction gives you more stuff. So I'm just going to do this really quick. This is probably really simple, but just to make sure. Um, so you have like these statements, okay? And you can turn like, you know, I rock climb, should get periods, um, as P and I snowboard as Q. And then you could just do like um, symbolic logic and create new sentences, right? So you could say this first one would be I rock climb and I snowboard. And the last one would be I don't rock climb falls or I snowboard. And that's it. Um, so if you wanted to like the one thing that sometimes confuses people, if I wanted to negate the whole statement here. I do need like things like parentheses and whatnot. Um, the way I had it, like the negation is just on the P, not on the Q. That's why it's like not here a negative um, snowboard line, basically. <clears throat> okay, so these are like the two kind of classic or three um, truth tables. Um, I mean, I guess my brain doesn't really even consider this one because it's so straightforward. But um, these, I do kind of hope that you know from geometry or at least kind of make sense of it right now. Um, so the conjunction one, um, I was just looking at it. I think there's a typo here. Um, the conjunction one is... Um, only true if both are true. So actually this one should have been false. Um, so it's the one that's like the and, right? And this P and Q have to both be true to have it be true. But then every other case has a false somewhere. So it's false. 
Um, for the or one, the disjunction, that one is sort of almost the opposite, where as long as one of them is true, then it's going to be true. The only way for it to be false is if both of them are false. Um, and negation is pretty straightforward. True becomes false. False becomes true. Um, and you just basically, when you do these like truth tables, I'll talk about this in a second, but you just need to make all the combos kind of appear here for P and Q. Um, and also, even if it's just one thing, there's two combos, right? Um, and the easiest way to do this is like if you have two, um, start with two here, two trues, two falses. Like basically the first chunk will always be trues and the second chunk falses. And then you'll alternate this one. And if you go and had like three statements, you still would make all your trues first, then all your falses. And then you would do chunks um, by twos and then chunks by ones for the last statement. Um, so the last one in like the last single statement should always just be alternating the way this is alternating right here. Um, but these are, you know, there's not much to say here. Basically, again, conjunction, both have to be true to be true, then it's false. Uh, disjunction, just one of them has to be true. So I just wanted to kind of make sure that you understand how to do this for more statements. So if you have, um, let's just do um, P, Q, R. So say we needed three statements for something right here. You, If you have three statements, you'll always just start with, in this case, four trues, four falses. And you really are just making all the combos appear somewhere, but um, the most organized way to do this is to just have chunks of four first for three there, and then this would be chunks of two. True, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And then this one would just alternate true, false, true, false. Um, if you basically made like a tree diagram or something, you would see that doing it this way actually gives you all the combos, basically. Um, and if there were four statements, you would just have, you wouldn't be starting with four, you'd be starting with eight. Um, it's basically a, um, there's like a formula if you want um, to think about it. It's like a power of two thing, but we don't even really need to do that. It's pretty clear that like if you, why I would pick these, but this is just gonna give me like, um, you know, the way I kind of see it is like all trues in the top, all falses in the bottom. And then this one false kind of moves through. So it's here and then it's here. And then I have two falses. And then one false, you know, there's like a pattern to how this goes. Um, so that's how you do it for three. I don't even think I'll really do four for you. It's just similar, but you would have eight and then eight and then four, 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 and so on. So that's how you do it if you have three though. So I just wanted to do an example. Um, so if we have like P or Q, then only one of them need to be true, right? So I would have true, 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 false for that column. P and Q, you would have um, just both need to be true to be true. So false, false, false. And then the negation would just be false, true, true, true. And then the um, this last statement, right? Um, and really the way this works is basically I could ask you to do something like this and the sort of work, right, would be to break this down into its kind of pieces here. So. I had a P or Q, so I needed that column. I had a P and Q, so I had that. I had a negative, so I had that. And then the last part, you know, it's kind of like just showing work in math. Like this last step will just take the conjunction of this column and this column right here. And so, you know, my final truth table would just read uh, false, true, true, false. Because, you know, if you look at these two columns, there's only one truth, so that's false. There's two here, so the conjunction would be true. There's two again, so that would be true. And then again, there's only one, so that would be false. Um, so those are kind of 
I'm not going to do more examples with these. I think that's kind of clear for those ones. The one that I want to make sure we talk about a bit more is really probably the one that matters the most to like proofs, and that's the if then one. So these conditional statements um, are statements of the form if then. And we use this either like a double arrow like that or a single arrow like that. Um, but these are sometimes a little weird if you've never seen a truth table for it. Um, basically, I think of this thing as a promise, this if then statement as a promise. And it'll be, um, you know, like if I take this first row, okay, the, you know, if I use this silly example, like, if the mouth steps on the mouse trap, then the trap will spring. Basically, the promise is, if the mouse steps on the trap, it will spring. So here, this was just exactly what happened. The mouse stepped on the trap, the trap sprung. That, it, that promise is true, like it all worked out. You know, this is the weird one. Um, I said that if this happens, then this will happen. So the mouse stepped on the trap, but the trap didn't spring. So my promise that I said was basically, it was almost like I lied to you or something. That's like my lie case. And that's why this one would be false. Um, the other ones, I never, you know, it was all dependent on um, the first thing happening. So when this one didn't happen, I can't really say I broke the promise. So I have to assume that that's true. So if this, if the mouse didn't spring on the, step on the trap, um, and the trap sprung, I don't really, I can't say that's false because I didn't break the promise. Um, the promise was that if the mouse stepped on it, then it would spring. Um, this one, I think makes a lot of sense too, because like the mouse didn't step on it, the trap didn't spring. So that makes sense. That seems true. Um, you know, this is the one that is just the lie. That's the one where I, the thing I said would happen didn't happen. And so that's false. All the others are you have to um, take as true. And that can be a little weird. And I would kind of maybe encourage you to like look at some other examples. There's so many examples of these kind of things on the internet about why these are true. But um, this is actually the one that will end up mattering the most to us. So it's kind of an important one to, to know. The, probably the second most important one um, we will prove a lot of things called biconditionals. So a biconditional um, is kind of what it sounds like. It's a conditional in two different directions. And um, these are statements that are read if and only if. So we'll have a lot of these in, um, in like our linear algebra class. We'll have things like, you know, this linear algebra result well, what happens if and only if this other thing happens. And... It's really, we do abbreviate it sometimes IFF, like if I'm ever being lazy on the board or something, I would do that. Um, but formally, we would always write it out if and only if. And the first if here is kind of your forward directional conditional. And the only if part is your other direction. So sometimes even when you do math proofs, like um, the way that we're going to do these, we're going to prove both directions. And sometimes, like, when you write them up, you might even put these arrows, like, in parentheses, like, near what your the new paragraph that you're about to write up to show that, like, okay, this, this first paragraph is the forward direction, and then this um, paragraph or something is, like, the backwards direction. Um, and, you know, you can even do only if statements f without the first if. <laughs> um, so if I say this statement here, I am a nerd, is P, and I can solve a twisty puzzle, is Q. The way this would translate, actually, symbolically, if I write, I am a nerd only if I solve a twisty puzzle, only if I can solve a twisty puzzle, that actually would be Q implies P. So the only if sort of acts as like a directional reversing tool or sort of something like that. It, it really is talking about if this later thing happens, then I can promise you that's going to happen. Um, so whenever you see only ifs, you can actually assume the second part 
and you need to show this part. This is the part that you're trying to prove. Um, we'll see some of those, I think, too. Um, but definitely we'll see a lot of if and only ifs. And it's just two conditionals. And that's why the truth table's here. It kind of makes sense if you understand, like, the previous slide. Um, you know, now these middle two are both lies, right? True, um, like, tr like this happened, then the, the, you know, the trap didn't spring or something like that. That's the lie. And then going reverse direction here, if the Q happens, P should happen, but Q happened and P didn't. So this is also false. Um, so it's basically just giving you another false case. Um, yeah, so let's do this example. This is the last thing I want to do. Um, so if I um, have this statement that I want to get the truth value of, basically the way I would write up my table would, I would need, I already definitely need a P, a Q, and an R column, right? And then I need a Q or R, R column. And once I have this column and a P, I can basically just do, you know, apply this table, these rules um, to this one. So Q or R would look like, uh, Q or R would look like true, 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 false, true, 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 false. And then the biconditional part, you would only get a true if they're either both true or both false. If they're alternate like that, then it's going to automatically be false because there's like a lie there. So if I do, um, you know, I'm basically looking at this column and the first column. So I'm just looking, sometimes when I do these two, I look, okay, that one's true, that one's true, that one's true. I'm looking at just any ones that have the same um, letter. And sometimes my brain just likes to go down the list and put trues for those. Um, but any way you want to do this, if you want to do it that way and then fill in the falses later, that's all I'm saying you can do. Um, but those would be the only ones that are true, and the rest would just be false, false. Um, yep, false, false. And that would be it. Um, so it seems kind of silly to think that this could actually be useful, this kind of stuff. But there really were a lot of problems in like my harder classes where I needed to take the mathematical statement, define it as like a variable, and then really start to break down what I'm trying to prove and it gives me like a method of attack almost. Like it helps me figure out the best way um, to go about maybe proving something. So for right now, like the goal of the first homework assignment is just to kind of make sure we can do these tables, but um, we will get into like actual proofs with them, um, with real statements here soon. Um, but this is just kind of general geometry kind of recap with symbolic logic.